teach you one thing that you must take home. How to convert exposure to behavior. How to convert exposure to behavior. I have a message I titled the three E's of life. And E number one was education. E number two was exposure. E number three, experience. These three elements are very necessary if you're going to do great things in life. Exposure, education, experience, right? So you need these three. Go get the message. I also want to recommend get the uh, Jacob and Esau Dynamics. Oh, I taught some strong business principles from there. I taught, I, I taught some strong business principles. So go get those messages. And there are other ones as well. Now, but today I want to center on exposure and how to convert exposure to behavior. I have met people. Now, uh, I'll use the United States. I, I, before I, I, I lived there, I went there more than any country else in the world. And then, of course, I have lived there for some years now. So in the United States, I have met immigrants who don't behave like they have left their streets in Nigeria before. I'm not trying to be nasty. I'm not trying to talk to anyone. I'm telling you truth, plain truth, how it is. I've met people that <laughs> even in Nigeria, ah, no now, even in Nigeria, the way they look in America, even in Nigeria, people will look at them and, ha, huh, and pity them. They have not released themselves to exposure. They are in an environment that doesn't reflect in anything they do. Their business principles, their standards, personal behavior, nothing. And so I have researched through the years, through the years, through the years, I remember, <laughs> God help me, let me focus on this one and leave the rest. Why don't people allow themselves to be influenced by exposure? Exposure by itself is not enough. Exposure by itself is not complete until it reflects in your behavior. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, all these people, they travel. They go here, there, there, there. But when they come back, there's no change around them. They don't act like something has shifted around them. A few tips that can help you gain the kind of exposure that will reflect in your behavior. Tip number one. Be intentional about seeking exposure. I'm also going to speak to you this uh, morning. It's still a few minutes. I think two, two, two more minutes till afternoon. I'll speak to you as a psychologist as well, as a, a behavioral scientist. Be intentional about seeking exposure. There are people who have gone out there, they've been to places where big things are happening, but they were not conscious of grabbing anything. So they just went and came back and remained as they were before they went. Be intentional about gaining a new experience. Be intentional about learning something. Be intentional about seeing something. Number two, open your organism. Which in pidgin English, like I hear them say, is shine your eyes. Okay? But I like to say, open your organism. For me, opening your organism entails a readiness to receive something. To see something and receive it. Let me tell you about uh, a personality type. The type that either never allows exposure, rub off on them, or it takes a lifetime before the tiniest inch of exposure shows on them. Now, there are people who are just naturally resistant to something new. They have a phobia for something new. So they guard old versions at the expense of new possibilities. They see people act in a certain way. They behave like it doesn't concern them. 
They're overly protective of old versions of themselves and feel intimidated to adopt new and better things that can work in their lives. If you have that kind of disposition to life, now, there is also an element of inferiority complex in that kind of disposition. Because when you see something that you should be learning from, you, because you feel intimidated, you act like you don't need it. But it's intimidation. You need it. You're just acting like you don't need it so that you can comfort yourself. If you're going to learn new things, you must, you must, you must destabilize your comfort zone many times. You must destabilize your comfort zone. I like to keep my eyes open. I mean open. So someone knocks his style like, 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 like a village headmaster. And then he comes to an environment where people are corporately dressed and know how to knock the tie. And he's still acting like, oh, come on. If it were me, I'll look. I'm like, I seem to be the only one whose thigh looks like it's from the Amazon forest here. I need to ask somebody something. And I won't pretend like I will walk up to someone and say, I like the way you nodded your thigh. This is beautiful. You guys should teach me this. That's my disposition to learning. That's why I learn fast. Someone else will be acting like, it doesn't matter. I'm carrying a tie that fills the entire chest. <laughs> I would talk about it. And that's one way to demonstrate confidence. I'm like, how do you guys ever get to knot ties that are so beautiful? Now, that way, no one is going to be laughing at me. That way, I have just given a compliment, and if I made a request, someone is so very willing to hook me up. Like we say in America, now I hear hook up is something, something, something else now. Okay. So, but in America, you can hook up someone with something means connect me with. That's American English. So, I would talk about it, I would appreciate it, and I would request to be taught. I'll request to be taught. And the next time I'm buying ties, I will look for these kinds of ties. I won't beat my chest and say, it doesn't matter. It's not this tie that will take somebody to heaven. You know, and become religious about it. So when we get to heaven, God is not going to ask you, what kind of tie were you not in? We, we already know that. You don't have to say it. We, 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 we already know. I was saying, keep your eyes open. Be willing to learn difference. Be willing to observe what is better. Be willing to ask to be taught. Sincerely, if you have an opportunity, say, to travel or something, and you return and your behavior is the same, you need, you need deliverance. That's the truth. You don't travel to just eat food and snap pictures and post on Instagram. Keep your eyes open. Enlarge your mind. Another thing that um, limits people from translating exposure to behavior is they maintain the company that reflects their old version rather than embrace a new company that reflects their possibilities. So they maintain companies that help them feel comfortable with their old version rather than embrace new relationships that can inspire them towards better things. Next point, be specific 
in what you're learning. What have I learned? I have learned that blah, blah, blah. When you're in stimulating environments, when you're in uh, preferred environments, you learn for uh, behavior patterns, you learn about standards, right? Behavior patterns, standards. So you learn about standards. And these standards can cut across many different things. Operations, how businesses are run, how churches are run. Where did I learn something we incorporated? I was in Scotland one time, many years ago. I don't know if that was my, was that my first trip to Scotland? I've been to Scotland many times. So, but one of those trips to Scotland, I went to a church called C7. Wonderful church. I'd never seen a concept like that before. Oh, I loved it. C7 is Christ seven times a week. But that's just the name of their church, C7. You see the concept? So, I got into the service. And as I got in, the service was like a concert. I loved the stage. Everywhere in the audience was dark, apart from the lighting that helped you walk. So they had lightings on the aisles, and then very thin lightings up, just enough to help you walk to a seat. Then the stage was fully lit, the lights and everything. I said, whoa, this is beautiful. So when I returned, we started trying to incorporate. And that's when we started, you know, uh, I don't remember where we were one time that we made sure the windows were tinted. Now you can see that our windows are tinted from outside, they're tinted and all. And we started trying to incorporate certain concepts. I learned it from there. I learned it from there. Last year, December, I was at a church in Las Vegas. And again, in all my life, I hadn't seen what I saw in that church. We can't incorporate that one yet. <laughs> yes, and I'm going to tell you why. This church, the production, their Christmas events production, whew, so they had professional dancers that come down from the ceiling in ropes. They are dancing and doing calisthenics and spinning. You can see we are not ready for that yet, right? <laughs> And the message was like a story. So they are telling a Christmas story and there's a child, there's stuff happening here, narrating a story and they're dancing and coming down from ropes, ropes going up, people are somersaulting. And my whole life, I have clips of that video. If I knew I was going to use it as an example today, I should have shot it on the screen. But I have clips of videos from that production. That's a church. That's their production. They had these professionals. It was, wow, mind-blowing. And they had different sessions for the same day. So it was pretty much like walking into Broadway. Have you heard about Broadway? I don't mean Broadway in Lagos, Broadway Street. There's Broadway in New York. Okay, so uh, Broadway has theaters where they do all these plays, and I mean world-class. That's how this production was. So don't just act like, oh, okay, something nice happened. No, think about it. So my next point is, think about something you see that is not the usual. So you think about it. You think about it. Now, you see, in building that kind of auditorium, they would have factored in all of those kinds of stuff. Where all those ropes, all those trolleys, and all the machines that control that kind of production. We don't have that, you know. So we will leave it. <laughs> but it was beautiful. And there are other things I learned apart from that, you know. How the service was presented. The story and what was happening in the background. And how they held us spellbound. Was amazing. Literally amazing. I couldn't have been anywhere else 
than at that church that evening. It left a lasting memory on my mind. So think. Next, ask yourself questions. How do I apply what I am learning? So you have access to what am I learning? Uh, you're intentional. What do I want to learn? You start asking yourself, how do I apply these things to my life? Our time is far spent, and I, I, I should have loved to stretch this a bit, but I can't. So, but let me try to round this off. I imagine that if you have an exposure, if you start relating with some kinds of people, if you start going some kinds of places, it will reflect in the way you conduct yourself. The very first time in my life I went to the United States and came back uh, about 12 years ago, right? I stood at my door and looked at my street. I was in shock for days. Oh, yes, I was. I was in shock for days. I was in shock for days. I thought it was a nice area of town until I went and came back. And yes, it was a nice area of town. I lived on Spring Road at the time. At that time, it was a nice area of town. Members of the House of Assembly lived on that same street. So, but I came, came back. I was quiet. I stood at my door. Spring Road, I looked at him. I said nothing to nobody, but I was just in shock, like. I've been living in a jungle since, I didn't know. For days, I was in shock. Then I started booting gradually, booting, 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 booting. Then I came back. But I was in shock for a long time. I will never forget the first airport in the United States I flew into. It was the airport in Philadelphia. It felt like I had arrived the city center. No, that's how beautiful airports are, generally. I've been to many airports. Heathrow, Gatwick. Uh, I mean, I'm even mentioning the big ones. I've, I've been to too many airports than I can count, you know. So, but these airports are built like cities. Charles de Gaulle, CDG, that's the airport in Paris. Beautiful airports. You enter the airports like you have entered a major city of the world. Do you understand? That's how they designed it. When you enter any one of those airports, you will realize that we don't have an airport in Nigeria. And I'm not joking. I love my country. I promote Nigeria, I am African, and I love to be a great ambassador of my nation. But truth be told, what we have is landing spaces. We don't have airports. Yeah, we just have where a plane can land, you know, and can take off, but we don't have airports. Because even the airport in Dallas, you think you're in the city. Been to tens upon tens of airports around the world. We don't have here. We will have. You know, we will have. When Hills becomes the Minister of Aviation, maybe. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What's the last point? Ask yourself questions about how to apply these things to your life. Don't be in a hurry to start bullying people on Facebook about something you saw in Australia. Apply to your life first. And that's the challenge that some people have. Once they travel and come back, nobody rests. They just start abusing people, insulting people, just talking, talking, talking. Their own lives, they've not applied anything to their lives. And their behavior is worse than it was before they traveled. But the most important thing is apply it to yourself. Can we see it in your standards? You realize that the average American is very scheduled. Tell an American, for example, who's visiting Nigeria that, um, okay, so let's say he comes for two days. He wants to know, so uh, in the morning, what are they having for breakfast? After breakfast, what are they doing? 
He wants to know uh, in the afternoon, if they are taking a walk, what street is going to be, what's on that street. They are, they are, they are very scheduled, scheduled, scheduled. When it's, once it's 9 o'clock or whatever time you have agreed that you're going to pick them, they are ready. If you're not there, they are worried. So I try to tell my friends, hey, uh, yes, we can be scheduled, but the transport system here is not as perfect as the one in the States. In the States, you're at the bus stop. You know every five minutes, the e-bus is going to come through this route. Every five minutes. And yours truly, if you come just when the next, when one is leaving, you can check your watch and uh, the next five minutes, there's going to be a bus. If there isn't going to be a bus, maybe there's an interruption. There, there may have been an announcement or something, but it's not usual that a bus will not come when it is supposed to come. So that's why you hear people say, I, I was rushing to catch a train. Yeah, which train are you rushing to catch? You are rushing to stand by the way, to wait for anyone that might come. Today, tomorrow might be 30 minutes that you wait. You, you, you can't predict it. The only thing you can do here is to come out a lot earlier to make up for eventualities, Right? So when they come, we try to make them a little bit flexible. But on the average, the American is very scheduled. I would imagine that if you have lived there or you have visited, somehow, somehow your sense of timing should improve. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your sense of timing should improve. My first... Um, trips to the United States. I lived with a white and it helped me. I'm very happy that I didn't start living with uh, uh, our brethren. I... Yes, I am happy and I'm going to tell you why. Because it helped me to, at that time, I didn't even know I was going to go back to live there. I mean, I kept, then people would ask questions, are you going to come live? I said, no, unless the Lord says, I didn't have any plans, you know. So, but it helped me to integrate into the culture, right? It helped me to integrate into the culture. It helped me to also see at very close range the manner of life and how things are done. How things are done. On the average, on the average, the white man is committed to excellence. On the average, I'm not saying every white man is excellent. I've seen many war war ones. So I'm not even talking about that. But we're speaking in generic terms now, right? On the average, the white man is committed to excellence. Excellence. He likes to do it well. He rubs his ego into excellence. And that's the part I like. When someone is not ashamed with poor outings, it bothers me. You know, this guy feels, look, if you want to see me, see me through my work. If you want to rate me, rate me through my work. So they do their best to make sure that their work reflects a certain image because that's their pride. I like that kind of pride. Where your output is your source of pride. Not just your personality, your output. So excellence is your pride. That is good pride right there. Now, so on the average, that's their mindset. So when you hear that someone does this thing, they'll do it so well. And that someone is a toothpick maker. Ah, it will be so unique. Whatever they do has to be very good. I expect that you learn that. You see that. You learn it. You adopt it and apply it to yourself. And I think that when you travel thousands of miles away from the rainforest and you return, there should be something that people can see and say, this person behaves a bit different from the average. Your talking should be different. I'm not talking of accent necessarily. You're talking. The, I mean, the way you talk to people, the way you treat people should be different. Because generally in Africa, I mean, general, as far as general behavior, we treat people differently than the general way of treating people 
out there. So, but if you have done business out there or you've lived out there, when you come back, I imagine you will treat people differently. That should reflect that you have learned something that now reflects on you. So, you see, be intentional about what you want, about the fact that you're going to learn new things. Keep your eyes open. I said keep your organism open. See things. Identify difference. Realize that this manner is better than this. It's not everything I can pick from America. There are some things about lifestyle that I do not like. I do not appreciate. And I made sure I kept driving it into the ears of my children. Kept driving it into the ears. Kept driving it into their ears. We're kingdom people. This one is mm -mm, it's not part of us. But for the most part, there is a lot to learn. A lot to learn. So much to learn. And when you're conscious about receiving it, when you are willing to amend your behavior, you're not protective of dysfunctional behaviors, primitive lifestyles. Because some people protect primitivity a lot. You know, they don't open their eyes to anything new. They just repel it, act like they don't see it, or act like it doesn't matter. It matters. Can't go and live in America and come back and you're behaving like someone who lives in... What's the name of that place? Akansoko. <laughs> or oh, there's one place in Bakasi they call Black Bush. Oh, yes, it's a place. And that's the name of the place, Black Bush. Itumbunzo. Then that's a disappointment. I met a professor one time at the United Nations. Uh, this was in 2014. Ah, okay. So, and he had lived in the States, if I'm not mistaken. Was it 20 or 40 years as at that time? I could not establish in fairness that this man ever left Uyo ever in his life. I couldn't establish University professor, yes. And he lived in a state in America, had lived there for about either 20 or 40 years. As at this time, when we met in 2014, this was in the United Nations. I couldn't verify. There was nothing I could see to verify that this man ever left it to bridge, like crossed it to bridge and went somewhere. You know. So, but again, that tells you about personality types. Some people are overly protective of their default uh, personality status. And doing great things there. The man was doing great things. Yeah, doing great things there. Uh, lecturing for, I think, one or two universities. Consulting for, yeah, doing big things there. But I, at that time, I wasn't living in the States. At that time, I'd been going to the States maybe just for four years or so. My English was cleaner than his. Yes. But again, our dispositions, our mindset. So have a disposition that embraces change, that acknowledges, observes, is willing to embrace change. Practice applying these things on a small scale, you know, progressively into your life, into your business, you can't be traveling out and coming back and you don't know how to have good business relations. You still talk to customers anyhow. You still behave anyhow. Your services are not properly rendered. No. There must be something. Brand your sales bags at least. So just add one small thing. Add one small thing. Add one small thing. You can't be making dresses and writing Christian Dior. When your name is Christian Edem. You're not Christian Dior. You're advertising Christian Dior. You can't make slippers and write Prada. Should have been Prada. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't do that. Promote your brand and give yourself a name that is sellable. 
I've seen some names that are just annoying. You just see the name of the product. <laughs> You're just angry at the product because of the name. Look, let me close. Seek counsel. Sometimes even in naming your business. Seek counsel. Talk to someone who has heard nice names before and ask them, how does this sound? Don't just carry it. You've carried all the first letters from all the names they gave you and your grandfather and great-grandfather's name. Sometimes it can come out good, but many times it does not. Kuta listing in his in his tenics. Customers have to be begging you to pronounce the name. <laughs> Is it a botanical name? Give it a nice, sellable name. Make it a global brand. And you will realize that simplicity many times is sophistication in disguise. Simplicity can be classy. now waters. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to drink that water first of all. What? Like seven statements in just one small sachet of pure water. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Please. Hmm? Something simple, fresh, fresh. Someone wants to be refreshed. They remember fresh. What kind of water are you buying? Fresh. What water is this? Fresh water. <laughs> fresh. Very simple names. So that's it. Questions? That is the end of my class. You have a question? Okay. Microphone, please. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir, for this um, class. It's really very exciting. Now, I have a question here. Okay, so there are people who, um, we are Africans, right? You said that at the beginning of the class, that you are Nigerian and you promote African culture. Now, how do we know the things to copy and apply. Now, this has nothing to do with um, whether they are kingdom related or, you know, general etiquette to copy and apply because um, I was challenging someone the other day. I said, look, don't try to make me feel ugly because I use hand to eat eba. You know, oh, no. the person wants to make, the person was like, of the opinion, like, we need to use cutlery. I'm like, look, a Chinese man will not use a uh, spoon to eat his noodles anywhere in the world. I can answer you. <laughs> so, so why would you want to make me use cutlery to eat eba so that I can look special or, you know, you say this is international etiquette and stuff. You know, so for me, that was something I, I, I wasn't going to change. Right. Does that make me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I realize, like, um, New York, for example, is like the melting pot of cultures in the world. It's probably the spot in the world that has the most, probably, uh, you can check this and confirm, but I am quite positive that it is that one city in the world that maybe has the most cultures coming together in one. So it's like the melting pot of global cultures. Now, when I teach etiquette skills, you guys should take my etiquette skills one day. And uh, maybe one of these services, I, I, I just want to teach you something different, something entirely different. Hmm? What? No, I will. I will. I will. I will. I have plans. I have plans. Next year, I have plans. Okay, so when I teach etiquette skills, I teach you global best practices, right? And then I also teach you flexibility. Now, this guy who eats eba with his hands isn't doing anything wrong. 
but there will be a problem, mark my words, there will be a problem if this guy attends a certain event of a certain class where water is not provided, but there is ever. Is someone feeling my pulse now? I like you guys. You're very intelligent. So you're getting my point. Now, so learn how to eat eba with cutlery. But whenever you have the opportunity to use your hands, there is nothing wrong with it. Even internationally, if water is provided and you can eat neatly, it's fine. You would find other cultures doing it their own culture. But there is always the international way of doing it, especially when the specifics of your culture are not provided. I'm telling you, there are times, even in this country, that you might just be in a place, there's no water to wash hands. But there's cutlery. Boy, don't die hungry. <laughs> you have to know how to eat it. And there is how to use cutlery. You have to start learning how to eat cutlery to eat with cutlery, right? You have to start learning how to eat with you know, cutlery. Learn how to eat rice with your left hand using a fork. <laughs> Learn. <laughs> it's very important. You will need it somewhere, somehow. And I wish I had the chance one of these days to just do an abridged uh, etiquette uh, skills class, um, I'll restrict that to just strictly on invite because the things you want to learn in your etiquette skills, uh, restaurant etiquette, dining etiquette, um, cocktail etiquette, and of course, dinners, there are different kinds of dinners. There are formal dinners, there are informal dinners, and the etiquette slightly, you know, differ from one to another. Why is a cocktail called a cocktail? How are white wines held? How are red wines held? Um, no alcohol. Okay. So, but it's good to know. So when you are in a global space, sincerely, you will be there soon. So stop looking at these things as far away. Start learning so that you can be accustomed to these things. And the day when you need to use it, you will do it easily. You will be crack, 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 crack. And then your plate has flipped. Your pomo is flying in the air. Shaki has stained somebody's white shirt. So there's a skill. There's how to deal with pomo when it's too hard. Hard pomo is a test of self-control. Does somebody agree with me? But 85 to 90% of people who encounter hard pomo want to teach it a lesson. And there's a skill to do it, but it takes time. And it's better in your bedroom. Eat it from the edges, slowly from the edges. Oh, come on. Why are you looking at me like that? You think I don't know how to enjoy life? So, but of course, I mean, right now, no, I won't do that. But that is what it is. In public, when you encounter hard pomo, it will pain you, but let it go. <laughs> Sow it as a seed. I promise it will pain you, but let it go. Because when you now look left and right and say, this Pomo, I'm going to teach you a lesson. That's when you teach yourself a lesson. Your shirt might stain or you might stain somebody else's shirt. You know. So you check it. If it's hard, you let it go. Have I helped you today? Okay.